welcome. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for inviting me to text by the day. Uh, great. So uh, as we all know, NLP can kind of, or at least it's my opinion, that can, NLP can kind of be a messy and a, and a difficult affair. And that's because you have to teach a computer about the, the, the irregularities and the ambiguities of the English language and the sort of hierarchical and sparse nature and all of the grammar. Um, but at Stitchfix, we use word vectors to help us learn from the raw text in customers' notes, and that helps us sweep away a lot of the problems, uh, a lot of these issues. Uh, and so that means that when we're trying to deliver this personalized experience to our customers and our clients, she says that she's in the third, third trimester, we know that she's pregnant, um, and you know, when she says that she used to wear scrubs to work, that she works in medicine in some way. And then when she says that she's taking a trip, that we can get her vacation clothing, right? So that's sort of the promise and the power of word vectors. And I want to start off by going deep, diving in very, very deeply into the theory of word to vec. All right, so now we've heard a lot of word to vec talks, but I'm going to try and take a wildly different approach to it. And I'm going to not mention neural networks at all in the entire time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, as, a, as a physicist, I sort of try to take things like as simply as possible, and I get a little bit lost when we add lots of layers. So I'm going to try and take this in a, in a very different direction. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about use cases at Stitch Fix. So we use LDA and we use WordTevec both. Uh, and then at the end, this is my favorite part of the talk. So if you've, you're tired of hearing about WordTevec, you should totally perk up for this last part. Uh, this is totally fun experiment. So this is playing WordTevec having nothing at all to do with NLP and nothing at all to do with text, right? So this is WordTevec on social graphs, again, no words. Uh, WordTevec on Spotify playlists, all, all kinds of crazy things. So uh, it's really weird that you can take this algorithm and you find deep connections to the rest of other fields. Uh, but anyway, before we start, I want to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, Chris E. Moody. And then, of course, if you do tweet anything, please do hashtag TVTV. Uh, I went to Caltech in physics. I did a PhD in astrostatistics and supercomputing afterwards. Uh, and now I'm at Data Labs at Stitch Fix. And so Stitch Fix is this phenomenal company. We do, uh, it really uh, does this uh, sort of high risk, high reward. Uh, research, right? And so for me, that's great. Uh, that means I get to play around with this fun stuff like Gaussian processes, T-SNE, word devec, tensor decompositions, and factorization machines. So, you know, aside from doing all this word devec, if you guys are interested in any of those techniques, I'd like super love to grab some coffee and just talk about that stuff with you. And of course, we're hiring, so if you guys are also interested in this kind of stuff, uh, talk to me about that as well. Great. So. Uh, I do want to mention that large swaths of the talk are sort of taken from other presentations and from other folks' papers, and these are much, much, uh, these are you know, established NLP guys. Uh, Tomasz Mikolov wrote Word to Vec, and if uh, you guys look at the deck after the talks, you can click on these links and it'll go to stuff. Christopher Ola is a Teal Fellow, and he has this beautiful blog with these interactive visualizations. Uh, Redeem Rahurek, who wrote GenSim and the Word to Vec package in it. Omer Levy and Yoa Goldberg, these guys are phenomenal. These guys are academics that have tied the algorithms behind Word to Vec uh, to sort of a greater body of sort of more established uh, NLP techniques. Uh, Richard Socher, who we heard a few hours ago, has this great NLP class. Uh, and Shin Rong, who have these uh, very lucid explanations of the Word to Vec gradient. Uh, and what it's actually doing. Okay, but why do we actually care about WordDevec? And I think that top example, which by now you've seen many times, but just sort of blows everyone out of the water, right? So it's king minus man plus woman equals queen. And that really means that the computer understands that the biggest difference between king and queen is the same as the difference between man and woman, all right? So it actually understands what it means. It can solve analogies. And we're not treating words as blocks. We're really instead modeling relationships between those words. And it's great because it learns that pretty much from the raw text. So we have to tokenize some stuff, but it's not like building a dependency tree or all this like grammar. We can sort of do it for different languages almost just out of the box. Uh, and these are distributed representations, and then that forms the basis for more complicated deep learning networks. So uh, the other thing I want to say is that this is not a deep learning algorithm. This is a very shallow algorithm. And in fact, I would even hesitate to say that it's actually fairly simple, right? And that's a powerful thing. That powerful simplicity lets us go super fast over lots and lots of data. And that's actually sort of like what I think is the crux of word to vec. Um, and so if you've been following the deep learning world, uh, you can get a lot of mileage out of pre-trained networks like CAFE or CAFE, Cafe I'm not sure how you pronounce it, or ImageNet. Uh, and you can kind of do the same thing with word to vec. You get word vectors that are already pre-trained. And if you don't have a super specialized vocabulary, you can get a lot of mileage out of just using those uh, <coughs> libraries. 
Uh, okay, all right, so the way that I'm gonna spend the next few minutes is I'm gonna set up this objective function for word devec. We're gonna randomly initialize all the parameters, in this case, the word vectors, and then we're gonna do gradient descent. Basically, the same stuff that you do for a lot of um, uh, learning algorithms. Great, so the objective for word devec is we wanna learn this word vector, in this case, v in. And we wanna learn it from its surrounding context, right? So that's basically the model that we wanna think about. And if you're thinking about SVD or LSA or LSI, you have this sort of, uh, this, this co-occurrence matrix and you take that co-occurrence matrix and you try to compress it in some way using SVD. Or if you're thinking about n-grams, you think of this transition probability matrix. Uh, but in this case, we wanna learn this vector directly. So no intermediates, no big matrices. We wanna learn this, this guy immediately. And we're gonna do it by randomly initializing them and then sort of doing gradient descent on the objective. So to give an example, uh, let's start with the fox jumped over the lazy dog. And in this case, we wanna maximize the likelihood of seeing this context given the word over, all right? So the over is gonna be our central word here. And we wanna maximize the probability of, give, of seeing the word the given over, of the, of the word fox given the word over, and the word jumped given the word over. And so this is fundamentally what word Debec is doing at a very, very small level. Like the most interior, like you see a bunch of for loops, and then right inside that last for loop is this thing right here, all right? So, the, and it's a really still a really simple assumption, you see, right? It's just given this thing, try and predict this other thing. So there's no other sort of secret parameters, there's no other conditioning, it's basically just this guy. All right, so let's think about this. What should we actually try and make this probability? We should make it, we know we want to find the probability for the word fox given the word over. Um, okay, well we know that we want it to represent, we know that we want it to be a word vector in some way. So fine, we'll rewrite this in terms of PV fox and then V over, and then we'll randomly initialize this stuff. But here's the small twist that word devec does. So we're gonna have two vectors for every word. Uh, and it's gonna depend on whether it's the word that we're conditioning on or whether it's the word we're trying to predict, whether it's in the input context or whether it's in the output context. And so we're gonna have a context window around every word. So if you go back to our example of the fox jumped over the lazy dog, we're gonna start with the word over, and that's gonna be our V in. And then our V out is gonna be the word the. And so we're gonna try and maximize the probability of seeing these two words. And then we're gonna maximize the probability of seeing fox given over. And then we're gonna maximize the probability of jumped. But remember that in this one, we're using V out for jumped and we're using V in for over. And so, okay, great. So we go scan across our whole context window. And so that's one of our for loops. And then you know, we, we move over. And now we're gonna train, instead of over, we're gonna train the word the. And so in this case, we're using the word the in the input vector. So it's a little bit tricky to think about this, but we have two vectors for everything. And then we scan across the whole sentence again. And we say, try to maximize the probability of the fox, or fox given the, and then jumped given the, and then over given the. And so this is at a high level, essentially, what word devec is doing, all right? So those are the, like, the two fundamental for loops inside of word devec, all right? It's, not, it's really not that crazy. And that's why, like, why I feel like it's a little disingenuous to talk about all of these like, layers. I mean, it's a neural network, but like, this is, like, I think, a fairly simple, like, two for loops is a lot simpler to me. Uh, okay, great, so how do we actually talk about this probability, V out given V in? And we wanna measure the loss between V out and V in. And we wanna make it such that if V in and V out occur all the time together, we wanna make them as close together as possible. So what are the different ways that I can compare two vectors? I could think of sort of like the Euclidean distance, I could subtract them and take the norm. But in this case, we're gonna take the cosine similarity between these two guys, and we're gonna say that, okay, great, so that's gonna give us a number between negative one and one. Okay, but we want a probability, and obviously we can't have a negative number as a probability. So we're gonna throw it into a softmax. All right, and so what does a softmax do? At least it's gonna get us a number that's between zero and one. All right, great, so that's a little bit closer to what a probability is. Uh, but what softmax really is at a conceptual level is it's making a choice out of n items. All right, so if you're familiar with logistic transformation or logistic regression, you're trying to transform, you're trying to predict one of two things. In this case, you're trying to predict one of n things, namely the word out of your whole vocabulary, right? And so if you're a statistician, the softmax is just a multinomial, um, but essentially it's just a, a sort of an appropriate mapping given that you could have picked all of these other words. So that's what it is at a conceptual level, but at an algebraic level, it's this guy, right? So at the top, the numerator is an exponentiation of those two words, again, the cosine similarity, but that bottom part is this pretty gnarly thing where I have to sum over all of the other words in my vocabulary, right? So this is happening 
every time I do one of those comparisons, when I do foxed and over, and when I do jumped and over, this guy is happening, right? And so this is a sum over all of the other possible words in my vocabulary. And so that is essentially the probability that sits right in the middle of word to vec, right? That's it, right? This is the kernel of word to vec. There's not, you see there's like not that much else to this, right? There's, we're just gonna apply this operation again and again and again and again, and then we're gonna update the vectors. Uh, so we're gonna just do normal sort of gradient descent. So it's a gnarly looking equation, but basically we take the derivative of that probability and say, yeah, move that probability and whatever makes those two vectors closer to each other. All right, so I'm not gonna go through the derivation of that. Richard Socher in his class does it, Shin Rong does it, you can look it up. Uh, but that's it, right? Like the rest of this is just gonna talk on some, it's gonna tack on a few hacks that make it a little bit faster, but like it's really not that complicated of an algorithm if you ask me anyway. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the performance. So that's just one, the inner part of my for loop. Uh, but of course that denominator is pretty gnarly. It's of order my vocabulary. Uh, and that means that you know, for every single update, I'm gonna have to do V operations. And then I'm gonna have to go across my whole context window. I'm gonna have to go, if my context window is 10 words, I'm gonna have to go five words back and then do it, you know, and then go five words forward. And I'm gonna have to do that C number of times, okay? And then after I do that, I'm gonna have to move one word forward in my corpus. And if I have N words in my corpus, my order is now V, C, and N. Okay, all right, well, that's pretty gnarly. How, how is that supposed to be some better than something like SVD, right? Like it's of sort of, sort of similar uh, order of complexity. Okay, but as any computer science student will tell you, if you have a linear problem, you can build some sort of tree uh, and now you can get a logarithmic problem. And you just have to pay the upfront cost of building that tree. Okay, so this is, this is now sort of getting into like refinements of word uh, And this is the hierarchical softmax, right? So that's all this is. So now you build a tree that looks a lot like this guy. And you have dark nodes and you have light nodes. And those dark nodes don't represent word vectors at all. They have vectors inside of them, but they're gonna represent a left or a right decision. And what I'm gonna to want to do is I'm gonna start at the top, and then that word vector, like say W2 in this case, might be the word that might, might correspond to the word jumped. Right? And I'm gonna to have to eventually find the path that gets me to the word jumped. And I'm gonna calculate the probability of having taken that path. So I'm gonna start at the top, and I'm gonna say, oh, okay, well, jumped, like I know out of the bat is word W2, uh, and so if, I want, if I'm starting at the top and I need to end up at W2, I need to take a left at this node. Okay, all right, so I'll write down that it's the probability of going left at node one. And then I know that the next step, I also need to take another left at node two. And so each one of these steps is another sort of softmax step, but in this case, I'm not using a word vector, I'm using this node vector and updating this node vector. And then at the last step, I need to take a right at that, all right? And so uh, I sort of glossed over some of the details here, but the crux of the story is that this is now logarithmic number of steps, right? And so if I have a vocabulary that's 50,000 words, that's like 10 comparisons, right? It's not that bad. Now, if I have a vocabulary of, yeah, those 50,000 words, this is 50,000 comparisons, right? This is why you really care about building a tree. Would you rather do 10 things or would you rather do 50,000 things? <laughs> so this is a lot faster. Uh, and so, yeah, I've, I've written out this. So basically the, the denominator of that softmax that we did out before would basically mean multiply everything with every single one of those white nodes in the bottom and figure out like what the total sum is and normalize by that number. Cool, all right. So great, so now our performance is substantially better. And now we can essentially scale up to 100 billion words, right? So that's roughly like the highest, I think, corpus I've seen come out of word -Devec. All right, so that's the real trick of word -Devec, that the fact that it can scale and just consume enormous amounts of corpus. I mean, every, anyone will tell you that more data is way better than a better algorithm. And this is a bit essentially just taking that and, and scaling it out. Um, and to put 100 billion words in context, a book, is about 10 to the five words, 100,000 words. And this thing can read 10 to the 11 words. So it can basically read a million books in a day, right? So it's a lot. Uh, and with that comes hugely, uh, which, which, which comes with just very well-trained uh, word vectors, right? And so here's sort of, uh, sort of qualitatively asking like how good are those vectors? And so you can see some of the other models. So this Colibert model that's on the top left took two months to train, right? Compare that to the word vector that took a day. Right. And when you look at this, like what are the most similar words to Redmond? And you can read down the column. 
Uh, well, they say it's Conyers and Lubbock and Keene, and that makes no sense to me whatsoever. But then Redmond for Wirtovec is related to Redmond, Washington. Okay, great. That's maybe almost trivial, but it's also related to, to Microsoft. Okay, well, Microsoft is located in Redmond. Makes sense. Uh, and then you can keep going. Havel is related to the Velvet Revolution. He was the president that sort of presided over it. Uh, and ninjutsu is related to ninja and martial arts and sort of, okay, great. This is like not quite synonyms, but it's pretty damn close. And you can compare it to all of the other things in this table, and it really doesn't, like the other models just don't come that close. Like it's kind of hard to see why they would be that great. Um, okay, fine. But maybe you're not convinced by qualitative things, and you can see that this is sort of a quantitative answer. Like let's throw some semantic and some syntactic tests in it. And in this case, word of blows everyone out of the water. Uh, the, all of the word of numbers, those are the bottom two rows, are two or three times higher than everything else you see on that table. And so there's two types of tests going on here. One of them is semantic. That's basically asking king is to uh, queen as man is to what, and it's woman. And in this case, semantic means that you have a gender relationship. And you can compare that to a syntactic test, uh, which means that you have tests like run is to running as walk is to, well, it's walking. In this case, you're not testing gender, you're testing something like a gerund form. And so that's what a syntactic sense means. And so you actually have two different kinds of word effect models, and only one of them is very sensitive to semantic things. Uh, and it turns out Skip Graham is you know, pretty good at both of them. Uh, but it's phenomenal that word effect is actually picking up both grammatical meanings and also semantic meanings. Uh, okay, but I do want to dive into this like king minus man plus woman uh, example. And so this is, this, is one of, this is what we put up on our blog like a few months ago. Uh, how do you actually do this kind of computation? So you load up all of your word vectors, uh, king and queen and man and woman. And so we're just showing two out of the dimensions. So there are potentially 500 dimensions or however many you trained with. It's a choice you have ahead of time. Uh, and you would get something like this if you PCA'd it or did some other sort of dimensionality reduction. Great, so we start off by taking the difference between man and woman, and I have the vector here reversed, but for pictorial sake, I think it's just fine. Uh, and you take that vector, uh, and so this is now the difference between man and woman. This is sort of codifying something that's like gender. And then you take the word king, and then you add that difference to it, you get a new point out here at the end, and now you search for all of the words that are near that point, and voila, the closest word, of course, is gonna be queen. It's kind of by coincidence that it actually learns this kind of stuff, right? Um, and so uh, when we go forward and we look, uh, great, so we get the answer queen. And it just turns out that this direction is consistent and it's a regular thing across the whole space of all words. So if we look at things like daughter and son and aunt and uncle, they're also in exactly the same direction, moved over by exactly the same amount. And remember that when we were doing this softmax thing earlier, we didn't say, hey, look, this axis, that's gonna be the femininity axis, right? We didn't do anything like that at all. It just happened that this crap just popped out by, by accident, right? Or almost by accident. And it's a really wonderful thing about WordDevec that actually does this. Um, okay, great, so that's like the more feminine axis, but of course we have 500 dimensions in this space, uh, so now we have you know, the higher status axis. Maybe this is like the biggest difference between man and king, is some sort of like more status kind of a thing. And so you can start to imagine that all these, di that all these dimensions are codifying things like, oh, is this an adjective or is this a verb? or all kinds of other relationships um, that can be present in the word vectors. Great, so what's really interesting are examples like this. Uh, check and currency, let's add the word vectors for check and currency and you get the word karuna, right? So which is the check currency or the check crown. Uh, and, it, and so when you look at those vectors, it actually makes sense. Like they're mostly made up by these two other words, right? And so we're actually living in this vector space where operations like addition and subtraction are meaningful, right? Uh, and, so, and so you can get things like German plus airlines, you get Lufthansa, right? Uh, or French and actress, and you get a bunch of other French actresses. Uh, so you can see that these vectors are really made up by other ideas, and those ideas are being encoded in vectors in some way. Uh, and it's really cool to think of this stuff as being mixes of other, of other ideas and vectors. Uh, so here's an example of this working uh, in industry in, in Stitch Fix. And so we have a lot of text from our clients. So I should probably roll back and actually explain what Stitch Fix actually does. Uh, we are sort of a personalization company uh, where we have clients that come up, they register on our website, they say, hey, I'm this size, uh, and, and a stylist goes through your profile 
figures out what would work great for you and sends you a box of your own items, or of, of items of clothing. And then the customer writes back and says, yeah, that fit me great. I love the stripes, uh, you know, but like the arms just didn't quite fit me totally well. And so there's all kinds of subtlety and nuance in this kind of stuff. Uh, but we get 20 or 30% of a Wikipedia in terms of text. So it's a ton of text. Um, and so we have it associated at the item level. And so we can do things like, okay, take that text about item 3469 and try to make it, uh, I don't know, try to find like the pregnant version of that, right? And so to give you a little bit of an idea, uh, item 3469 is, is, is this top. It's a black and gray uh, top. And when we try to find other things that are, have, that are more close to or pregnant, we get things like, okay, well, a list of other items. But if we take that list of items and we sort of look at the pictures for it, we get this, right? So we get these outfits that are perfect for maternity, right? They're, they're black and white, they're, they're sort of soft and they're flowy and they're safe for expecting mothers. Uh, and this, is, this is, has nothing to do with the images whatsoever, right? It's just how people are talking about these items. So, and it's great, right? We haven't really, we haven't had any sort of like hard metadata. We haven't had to like, like manually annotate anything. This is purely searching with the data that we already have. Uh, and in fact, like you get lots of different flavors for words. So this is an example of looking at all of the words that are related to the word vacation. So our clients are requesting vacation clothes all the time. And WordDevec is learning from that. Um, and so it actually comes in a lot of different sort of categories and clumps. And it's maybe a little bit hard to see, and I chose kind of awful colors here. But you can pick things like, there's, you can see a whole thing of wedding words, bachelorette, rehearsals, holiday events. So you can see birthdays, brunch, and Christmas, and Thanksgiving, and spring, and summer. And these are sort of seasonal words. And so each one of these things is sort of going off in its own direction. And WordDevec is sort of encapsulating it. Yeah? I was just wondering how you compose the metrics the vector for item 3469 over here, yeah, or any of these items. Uh, yeah, so uh, when, when, they, when the clients leave back their feedback, they leave it at the item level. And so we can do something just as simple as either just Doctovec, or we can literally write a sentence where the very beginning of that sentence literally has the word item 3469 written right in front of that sentence, right in front of that comment. And so then it just gets, uh, you, you learn from the context around that, that, that item 3469 has something to do with the comment that follows it. Okay. So it learns like stripes or gray and black and white. Um, yeah, and, and then feel free to interrupt whenever too, guys. Uh, okay, so we don't just use word to vec we also use LDA in our production systems. And so it's worth a little bit talking about when you would want to choose word to vec and when you would want to choose LDA. Uh, and word to vec I think, is great for learning word vectors and document vectors. Uh, and in general, is great for feature generation for machine learning models. So if you're interested in uh, trying to figure out if someone's gonna churn, for example. It's probably a great signal somewhere along the way uh, because it'll have codified in, inside of that vector in some way that you know, she's unhappy or that she's saying things that correlate with some sort of unhappiness or something like that. Uh, LDA, on the other hand, is gonna give us a topic distribution for each document and it's gonna be great uh, for tags and that's exactly what I wanna show you next. So whenever we have uh, clients they might write in saying, you know, I loved every choice in this fix, great job, great. So we have the tags, great stylist and perfect. And, they're, and this, this kind of uh, data is great for our analysts. They can measure the health of our business uh, and measure sort of keep and track metrics. But really our business is a lot about personalization and about delivering that very curated personalized experience and it's all about helping the stylist do what she does best. So in this case, we have the body fit tag, and the, and the customer has, has written, my measurements are 36, 28, 32, if that helps. Um, I like wearing some clothing that is fitted. I very hard for me to find pants that fit tight. And so as a stylist is trying to look through all of our inventory and trying to figure out what is appropriate for her, she might wonder, you know, I have no idea if this item is gonna fit her great or not, and she has to look through all of the customer tags and try to figure out, or all of the customer tags, and try to figure out just the right appropriate amount of text. And she can zoom right into there because she knows that this little snippet has to do with body fit. And so it helps our stylist immensely. And it helps their job go much, much faster. Uh, so in this, and here's another example. I really enjoyed the experience in the pieces. Sizing for the tops was a little bit too big. Looking forward to my next box. So there's one of the tags comes up as just excited for next. Uh, and we also have a sizing uh, for tops tag. So it's again like very, very useful for getting just the sizes <laughs> correct. Uh, another sort of where we can get into really, really granular forms here is that when she writes, it was a great fix, love the two items I kept, and the three I sent back, 
really close. Right? So this is really, really useful for us because on the back end, she didn't send those three items. It looks like an outright three rejections, right? But it wasn't, right? We got pretty, pretty close here. Uh, and so in fact, like we just need to take this fix and sort of just tweak it just a little bit. And that's what, it, what a stylus is good at doing, but we just need to surface that to her in an intelligent manner. Um, and that's what LDA helps us do. <clears throat> so LDA, in fact, is, it can give us an incredible amount of structure and detail information. Right, so now this is a T-SNE diagram. So this is, uh, we've seen it a few times today, but it's essentially a projection down to two-dimensional space on LDA on all of the item comments. And so in each one of these cells is a picture of that style or of that item that we send out. And what you see here is, I'll zoom in on the clusters later on, but what you see here is that there's a lot of structure, a lot of clumps, right? So had you seen like one big blob, like I wouldn't have said there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of structure, but instead you see a lot of little things everywhere. And you can start to investigate them, right? So if you look at the cluster up there, you see it's a whole thing of jewelry. Like folks talk about these things in the same way, right? So they're talking about this jewelry as if it's clunky, big jewelry. There's another cluster somewhere else where it's like thin, delicate pieces. This is not that cluster, right? In fact, there's, we're, capt we're capturing a lot of that granularity in the language. We can go somewhere else. We can look at these tops, right? And so these are all sort of described in similar ways, right? So don't look at just the color, but look at like the size, the color, the fit, the style of it. And th these are what our clients are talking about, and we find that these items are similar in the same language. And the same is true for these dresses. These are sort of bright summer and spring dresses. Uh, and this is all sort of like very, very uh, sh showing a lot of like the structure and a lot of the detail that we can get out of text. Uh, and of course we have sort of a maternity, we just launched a maternity line, which is why I'm showing so many examples. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is sort of the maternity cluster. And so Stitch Fix is a lot about doing sort of recommendations that mix machine learning with this human stylus component and living at that intersection. Uh, and so we have sort of have this very Netflixy sort of problem of trying to do uh, recommendation engines. And what you see on the left is a T-SNE diagram. You're actually seeing the same thing on left and right, but on the right-hand side, I've replaced all the points for items with their images. And what you're seeing on the left-hand side is learning from just from the ratings matrix, right? So a zero to four rating, right? And then on the right-hand side, it's say, okay, now that you've told us zero to four what you think about this item, Tell us, like, write us a paragraph what you actually think about this. And so you can see there's a tremendous amount of detail in this right-hand diagram that doesn't exist in the left-hand one, even though they're sort of fundamentally capturing the same kind of information, just the text is holding a lot more than individual little ratings. Okay, all right, well, we're a recommendations company. Well, we would love to use this some way in our recommendation engine. Um, but, uh, but, but I wanna move on to talking about sort of triggering actions from customer text instead. Uh, all right, so you know this happens to all of us. We can get disappointed customers and clients. Two items were not received. I know you folks do an excellent job and serve a lot of people. Uh, typos happen all the time. Serve a lot of people, some mistakes will happen. Just thought you'd appreciate the honest feedback. Well, we do. Uh, and we can take comments like this and we can vectorize them with Doctivec and that gives us training features to then sort of train on. Uh, and then stylists, they're always going through every fix, but they don't usually have the time to do all this stuff. But they'll give us training labels and say, oh, something like this, we need to send that to a customer service agent who will figure out what went wrong, like was it UPS that screwed up or FedEx or was it something in our warehouse? Uh, can we give you a coupon? All kinds of different things that we can do after that, but this just lets us like surface it at the very highest level somewhere along the way. And so those machine learning models just build cues for our customer service agents and they just work down those cues. Um, all right, so there's a lot of things I didn't mention, and I'm sure that you guys are very familiar with a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, you kind of need a lot of text. So if you have a specialized vocabulary, folks talk about the clothing in a very particular way. Uh, and if you need to sort of have your own specialized vocabulary, you need to have hundreds of millions of words to sort of start training with WordDevec. You need a thousand books, roughly, and to, well, that's roughly 500,000 comments on a blog post or four million tweets, right? Uh, and in your own sort of like language for whatever your domain is. Uh, you need a high memory, high performance, multi-core machine. It can take us several hours to several days, to, but you kind of don't need to train that often. So it's not a big deal to just grab an EC2 instance and go to town. Uh, but also you can just use the pre-trained vectors most of the time, and then this is an issue at all. Uh, and then also SQL bases, databases really aren't well suited for doing vector math and for doing additions and subtractions. 
Uh, so there's, so you have to rely on things like Annoy, which is this awesome Spotify library for searching in high dimensional spaces or locality sensitive hashing. And of course, like any sort of machine learning system, you're gonna have false positives. So make sure that you build a system that's robust to results that a computer thinks will be relevant, but a human expert would never do that. Uh, okay, all right, cool. So this is my favorite part of the talk. Uh, this is where we're gonna take word to vec and we're gonna sort of uh, change what uh, words mean and we're gonna change what context means and we're gonna change what sentence means uh, and we're gonna sort of like, uh, this is why it was so important to cover the theory at the beginning of the talk where we're really gonna screw around with these ideas and see where we can go with it. All right, so what about summarizing documents, right? So we've talked about words. Uh, so when we're training word to vec, we're, you know, we might start with this example of we have extend in sort of the input context. We have all these other words around it. Uh, but you know, we're just going back five words and forward five words or however many words. Uh, a paragraph vector is really, you know, just expand the whole context. And instead of training the word extend or some other word, train a brand new word, I'm gonna call it doc1347, uh, and just expand the window around it, right? So it's not a totally crazy idea. Just kind of train it and then like leave the word afterward. You never see it again because you never see the paragraph vector again. Uh, and so that's essentially the idea of par behind paragraph and document vectors. I'm using paragraph and document as if they were the same thing. Uh, okay, so this is us using it in production, right? So this is uh, trying to find uh, comments that are similar to the word pregnant. So the first ones are, I am currently 23 weeks pregnant. Okay, all right, the word pregnant shows up literally. It's maybe not so exciting, uh, but not showing too much yet, all right? So this is not, I'm showing you a house. This is not, I'm showing you a presentation. This means, I'm showing I'm pregnant, right? So this is like the sort of subtlety and nuance that you can still get out of this, and I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, you get baby bump, postpartum, nursing, breastfeeding, okay, all right, these are, these are also sort of pregnancy-related words, and these are good candidates for our maternity line, essentially. Okay, all right, so if none of that stuff has blown your mind, I'm sorry, but I think this totally will, all right? So this is machine translation, right? This is going from English to, in this case, Spanish, and so what we can do is run word to vec on the English Wikipedia, right? And so we'll get things like, you can plot you know, four and five and three, the words four, five and three and two and one. Uh, but what's unique is like what we talked about earlier. We had those linguistic regularities. So we knew that these axes, that status and gender are gonna be like 90 degrees apart or whatever. And they're gonna be 90 degrees apart in Spanish too, all right? The difference is that like you don't know what, which way those axes were actually pointing. And voila, you can just get a matrix rotation that will move you from this 500 dimensional space in English to this 500 dimensional space in Spanish, okay? So my mind's being blown right now for seeing this, right? So like we have these, all these linear algebra operations, right? So we can find similar vectors, uh, and that means like a thesaurus search. Uh, we can add things, so that means mixing two ideas. We can subtract vectors, that means removing some concept out of some other concept. And you know, now we can do matrix rotations, and that means moving from one language to another language. And I love the idea of having these linear algebra operators translated into sort of linguistic operators. And I think that's such a, a beautiful idea uh, that now we can sort of have this robust framework uh, and the tools for doing science on words. So uh, here's a different sort of experiment uh, that Omer Levy and Job Goldberg did. So they're like, okay, well, your context, I see your context, you're usually going back two words, you're going forward two words or whatever. Uh, let's build in that dependency tree that we started off by avoiding. Uh, so in this case, uh, the word Australian is modifying the word scientist, so it doesn't have anything to do with the word discovers, and we're gonna try and train the word discovers. And you know, discovers is acting on the subject, scientist, and it's being in some way modified by star and telescope. Okay, all right, so that's gonna be our context now. Uh, and so this is, these are the kinds of results when you screw around with the context. Instead of making this flat rotating window, you kind of start to respect, respect the grammar. Uh, and so what are the words most similar to Hogwarts? So on the left-hand side, you get bag of words model. This is the traditional sort of word to model. And so you get things like Dumbledore, Hallows, Half-Blood. Okay, all right, so these are all Harry Potter words. All right, great, got it. Uh, and the, when I saw the words on the right, I did not make any amount of sense to me, right? I was like, Sunnydale, Collinwood, Cal Arts, Greendale. Uh, so, but if there's any parents in the room, they're schools, absolutely. And not just schools, they're elite schools, in the same way that Hogwarts is an elite school. So these guys are calling this functionally similar uh, as compared to like topically similar. So it's really cool that Hogwarts fulfills the role of being a elite school in the same way that these guys are filling the role of being an elite school. It's a good catch. <laughs> uh, all right, so 
fine. Everything there was still dealing with like NLP, but this is word of egg applied to a social graph, so no text whatsoever. Uh, and so in this case, we're going to call uh, words of uh, vertices in my graph. So if I'm friends with Sandeep and Sandeep is friends with John and John is friends with Fred, our sentence now becomes the sentence of Chris, Sandeep, John, and then Fred, all right? And then you, know, you can replace those with you know, your Facebook IDs or whatever you want. And that's it, right? No text, no English, no grammar, nothing. Uh, and what's really cool is that when you look up the vectors for Chris and Sandeep and John and Fred or whoever, those vectors explain a lot of the properties of the graph and of your neighborhood that's around you. In the same way that page rank explains a lot of the relationships that you see in a graph network, and spectral clustering uh, explains a lot of the, those relationships, and it does really well on all of these performance tasks, right? So right now, WordDevec went from like this NLP algorithm to sort of being a, a general sort of sequence learner or a set learner, right? So for you guys, uh, when you go home, you guys should be thinking about, or, or work or whatever, you guys should be thinking about what sets, what lists, what bags of stuff do I have? Like, can I just throw WordDevec at it as if it were just a bunch of items and having nothing to do with NLP? Uh, so Eric Bernhardson at Spotify said, yeah, I can totally do that. Uh, so in my case, my sentences are going to be playlists, and my words are going to be song IDs. Right? And, um, the idea being that things like Jay-Z songs are going to be pretty similar to Notorious B.I.G. songs because they always appear in the same sort of rap playlist together. And so he has this metric, and I'm sorry you can't really read the text that well, uh, but the word devec is that second uh, to the top and it performs admirably. Uh, and so well, the question was, what's the performance on related artists? Like, who is actually related to who? And this is a lot like asking, like, a thesaurus lookups or, like, the synonyms that we've looked at word of before. So Notorious B.I.G. has an, a vector that looks very, very similar to the Jay-Z vector because they appear in the same playlist. So that's a totally crazy uh, use case of word of just applying it to, you know, um, playlists instead of, uh, instead of words themselves. Okay, so by now you've probably kind of figured out that uh, we're going to do exactly the same thing at Stitch Fix, and so now our sentences are fixes. So fixes are five items in a box, um, and then words are the items that go in that box. And the idea being that those items aren't independent. Uh, they are, in fact, going to be picked out for you because a stylist thinks that you are a classic dresser, or he thinks that you are an edgy dresser, you think so you are a boho dresser. So those items go co-occur together because they have sort of a coherent style in some way. Uh, okay, all right, so this is another sort of T-SNE diagram of it. And we have lots of structure, that's always a really good sign. And if we start to zoom in on parts, we start to look at things that look a lot like as if I were, you know, this is, this is basically like looking into my wife's like closet, for example, or my wife's wardrobe. This is all sort of like consistent clothing that one person would wear. And if I look at a different part of this graph, then this is sort of like, oh, this might be something that her friend wears or her mother wears. And it's not going to be totally her style, but all of these items sort of form a coherent ensemble altogether. Cool. All right. So I have a few minutes left, but I wanted to recap just that those paragraph vectors sort of, uh, th these are all the, the weird experiments you can do with WordVec. I just totally encourage you guys to think about what kinds of bags and baskets and lists and sequences you have at home and work, because uh, you can throw WordVec at it having nothing to do with text. Uh, I know that we're in an NLP conference, and I totally encourage you doing NLP, but you can also do all kinds of other things. Uh, so paragraph vectors, just screwing around the idea where the context window is, dependency contexts, uh, changing that window uh, grammatically, and then sort of they have this social word of ec where now my sentence is like walking around on this graph, random walks on that graph, and Spotify where they're like, yeah, my sentence is now a playlist, and the Stitch Fix where like, yeah, my sentence is just five words long, and it's these five items. So anyway, I think that this is a, a, like a super creative like application of word of ec. Uh, and just t totally takes it out of like the NLP domain. But anyway, you guys have been great. Uh, I can take any questions if y'all have any. <laughs> yeah, please, we'll start from left, I guess. Uh, so we've got like highly technical discussions with like support forum, and I have hundreds of thousands of things, not millions of things. You know, is there a way to take predefined things and blend it, or what would you yeah, absolutely. I mean, those pre-trained vectors will probably do you pretty far. You know, like in the, in the example that I showed earlier, and let's go way back here, um, right? So like pregnant, when they're using the word pregnant, it's pretty much the same usage of the word pregnant in general English. Now showing, that might be like a more subtle nuance that shows up in our database a lot more. Oh, whoops. 
sorry. Uh, 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 but in general, I think that, yeah, you can, uh, you can get pretty far just by using the pre-trained vectors. I would totally encourage that. Yeah, like, and then if, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we do is, in fact, combine our corpus with the Wikipedia corpus. So, uh, so that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, basically, the only thing that changes as you run along the corpus is the learning rate. So, when we're calculating those gradients, there's a coefficient that goes in front of that gradient. Um, and as you go through your corpus, it just gets artificially turned down lower and lower and lower linearly as you run towards the end of your corpus. Uh, but you know, you don't have to do that. Um, you can just kind of set it to some baseline and just keep adding text if you want. So, I mean, once you do that, you know, you, you kind of go into no man's land and no one's written papers on this stuff, but it probably works just fine. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about, or since you're a physicist, you might know more about. Um, so, imagine that we have a bunch of words mapped to word vectors in some way, and we're trying to learn the concepts that connect these words, such as what you mentioned, status, gender, uh, area of science, area of commerce. So what are the words that are the basis for the lattice or proximate lattice that you have drawn in this high-dimensional space? Has anyone done this? Uh, I not enough an expert to say quantitatively that no one has done this. Uh, I haven't actually seen anything like this. So what this strikes me is like you could try to do sort of like clustering on all of the words. Um, you know, clustering is okay, uh, and you could kind of do that. Another way you could do is like if you know, you basically want to take all of your words and sort of project them onto another basis of a few other vectors, right? I don't know how to learn those vectors a priori. You could try to do some sort of like tensor decomposition, which is what I've been thinking about playing. And so in, in this tensor, you have a document, and you have user, and then you have words in that document, and you have a third dimension because it's a word vector that's in that document, and then you try to decompose that into like a lower like dimensional space. You could try to do something like that. I'd be totally interested in seeing if that works, um, but otherwise, that could be super interesting. And I think that would be a cool idea because then it mixes sort of a lot of the concepts behind LDA uh, while using uh, word vectors. And word vectors are super useful because you get to have this, the referencing back to like this giant corpus of like human language. Whereas LDA, you're usually restricted to just your domain. So it's effective like sort of like mixing the best of both worlds. I'd be super interested if anyone does anything like that. Imagine you have a cold start problem when you have new items coming into your, uh, whatever you call it, corpus. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of needing to get lots of reviews back, we talk about this has got a crazy strike and I don't like it. Um, have you thought about sort of co-training with the images themselves so that in the early days, you, all you have is information on the image, which could be very powerful. And then yeah. you let the words take over there. Yeah, so the, the question is essentially cold start and whether we can, what can we do when we have very few words from the client? Um, so we, we kind of cheat at this, and we have merchants, and they give us a lot of description text about an item. So you can imagine if you're at Amazon, you have like the manufacturer writes something about their item. It's not quite the same as client text, but it gives you somewhere there, some, some of the way there. So that kind of helps us a little bit, but in general, isn't probably that helpful. Uh, one of the other things that uh, you can do is maybe yeah, use image vectors in some way. Uh, yeah, we've been thinking about how to map word vectors to the resulting image vectors. I think that would be super interesting. Uh, I, I played around a lot with coffee and the image net stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, you can imagine cooking up some sort of neural network that has as the input this document vector over here and as the output the resulting image vector over here and just hook, find some way to hook them up. And that could be a cool, useful way of sort of solving cold start in this, in this way. Yeah, that'd be super interesting. We have our last question here. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, for Stitch Fix, did you compare this with any collaborative filtering methods because it looks very similar? Yeah, so uh, I can't say the num numerical results of this, but I can give you the conceptual ones. And, uh, and it's basically encapsulated in this diagram. So that left one is a TSNI of the collaborative matrix, right? So this is a TSNI of user item and then rated it, or basically bought it or not bought it. Uh, and you don't see that much structure. 
right? So you basically see three clumps. And you know, what we'd like to see is like, oh, there's a clump for people who are highly correlated about jeans. There's a clump for people who are highly correlated about sweaters or clunky jewelry or boho styles. And it's hard to extract that much data out of something that's so blurry here. And that's because we, we, we were just basically just asking zero or one, right? Uh, compared to the text where you get you know, a ton more data. So anyway, I can't, I can't tell you how much our AUC is improved by, but they, they did improve dramatically whenever we started building it into our recommendation engines. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.